everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm back with Joel Friedlander. Hi Joel. Hi Joanna. <laughs> Great to have you back on the show. I think it's number four or maybe five on the show over the last nine years. <laughs> Some things it's good to lose track of, I guess. But I'm really happy, and uh, thanks for having me back. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. Let's just do a little introduction for those people who might not know you. So Joel Friedlander is an author, book designer, professional speaker, and blogger. He runs thebookdesigner.com, regularly voted in the top sites for writers, and has courses, templates, and many resources for authors. His most recent project, and what we're talking about today, is the Write Well, Write Writer's Journal, which I have a red copy of here. Joel I have a black one. Yeah, black one. So this I'm is... going to talk about that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that would be great. And that's what we're talking about today. So I'm very excited about this. Those regular listeners will know that about a year ago, I flirted with the idea. I went, I even met people about doing a journal. You have done a journal. So I'm excited. But why, for you personally, you've done so many books over the years. Why a journal and why now? You know, one thing about those books, they all have words in them. <laughs> and if you think about it, this is a book with no words yet. The words are um, latent, you might say. Mm. Uh, well, I use journals and notebooks. I've used them for many years. I am not a journaler in that I don't sit and record scenes uh, or what I did that day. But I, I still use them. Uh, for notes, for talking with clients, for developing ideas, drawing mind maps, whatever, recording conversations I'm having, because I realized a long time ago, you know, if I write it on a three by five card, you know, I'm going to lose that. And uh, if it's in a journal, you're not going to lose it. So I love journals. I've been using them for many years. I have stacks. My wife has even bigger stacks. And, you know, the problem is, Joanna, I'm a professional book constructor in a sense, you know, and many of these journals really are, some of them are lovely and many of them are very irritating and uh, <laughs> which is a problem when you have a little perfectionist streak. And, um, you know, I, I have thought for a long time, you know, I could do that better because I know how to put books together. And uh, so this year, I've really been more interested, Joanna, in doing more personal projects because I've been doing other people's projects for so long. I'm really interested in working on my own projects. And this is a project I knew that would bring me a lot of joy as well as help other people. So it does it get any better than that. <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> I totally agree that, you know, I, I understand why you – went into and then out of this project because it's actually quite daunting. Um, and even though I've made hundreds of books over the years and I know all about book binding and papers and adhesives and all that stuff, uh, this project stumped me and it took me, I, I thought it was going to take about six weeks and it took over a year <gasps> to put wow. together the materials, uh, the way of manufacturing, the right vendor. And, uh, it was very, very challenging, but, mm. um, very pleased with the outcome. Yeah, so we're going to get into the challenges because I definitely think they are underestimated. But let's first talk about the features that were important to you when you went into this. So like you said, I can do it better. Uh, so what are the features? For example, I having been down this path, it's interesting, the cover you sent me this, um, I would say oxblood, is it an oxblood? Cranberry, we call it. Okay, cranberry. Cranberry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a thriller writer. I prefer oxblood. Um, but it's okay. a, a, like a dark red to those who are not watching the video. So uh, if you're on audio only, I've got the, the kind of cranberry. And it's got these rounded corners, which I know are are impressive. Um, what were some of the other things? It's got a ribbon. I've got the little ribbon here. Uh, so what are the other features that were important to you and that impacted the design process the most? So what are things that people take for granted that are really hard? Yeah, well, um, there, are, there are a lot of elements that come into creating physical products. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And, and books are no different. A book is a physical product. And a journal is even more so because, you know, this isn't restricted to uh, bookstores, uh, particularly. You can you can sell them anywhere. But there are a lot of manufacturing demands uh, and financial demands 
to doing it. But what I was looking to do was to correct some of the errors or irritations that I had using other journals. Like, for instance, the journal that won't lay flat. Mm -hmm. That was my number one goal. And you can see from this journal here, uh, for those who are watching this, that these journals will open flat anywhere you open it in the book. And, you know, if you have one that's like a hardcover journal, you may have experienced, you know, leaning your elbow on one side so you mm -hmm. could write on the other side. Well, I just found that is wrong. Your journal should be a pleasure to use and it should lay flat so you can write in it easily. Um, the rounded corners were really important to me because these are very mobile. Uh, people carry their journals with them. They stick them in their purse or their uh, suit, briefcase or even in their pocket or their backpack. And so the square corners tend to get banged very easily and they get dog-eared and they fold over. I don't like that. So the solution to that is the round corner and that does take special finishing at the printer. Um, the paper obviously was super important that it be able to absorb uh, all kinds of writing instruments well. Uh, the way the interior was laid out in mine, you could tell that I'm a minimalist <laughs> because I created this journal specifically for writers, not for sketch artists or bullet journal planners or productivity people. No, this is just a canvas for writers to write, and it was optimized for that. So there's no interruptions. It's just lines on the page. Now, Joanna, I know you like the blank page. Uh, but um, in my first go around, I thought lines or rules, as we call them in printing, would be important. Mm. So we got the uh, lay flat binding, the round corners, uh, the good paper, the minimalist interior, the ribbon you have to have. If you don't have a ribbon, it's really hard to sell it as a journal. Oh. You know, whether you use the place marker or not, because a lot of people just stick pieces of paper, business cards, whatever in there. But if it, it doesn't look like a journal without the ribbon, that's, that's a interesting. Is it a visual cue? Yeah. And hasn't it got more pages in? Well, uh, also, most of the journals sold in the U.S. run between 160 and 192 pages. And one of my problems with that is you have to keep replacing them. And so uh, these journals, Rightwell journals, have 240 pages, substantially larger, and they won't need to be replaced as often. I also was very irritated over the years by trying to find things in my journal. Mm. You know, maybe I wrote down an idea for, uh, and this is actually true, an idea for a bean dip recipe. You know, and one day I went to try and find it, and I must have spent 15 minutes just leaping, 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 leaping. It's so irritating. So uh, these journals actually have page numbers mm. on pages. And then at the end, there's an index page where you can actually kind of create a little index to what you've written and you can find it right away. I thought that was a pretty good innovation. And uh, lastly, I would say many of the journals uh, I've bought are tend to be kind of narrow. And I don't know if manufacturers make them that way so they're easier to fit in your purse or pocket, but I find them a bit claustrophobic because uh, I, I just get to the end of the line too soon. So I intentionally made these journals wider than the normal ones. And uh, I'm very, very happy with the results. So those are some of the product innovations that I put into Writewell journals. And I believe they're kind of unique. I don't know of another journal on the market that has these kind of qualities. Mm. And I will say, Joanna, all the feedback I'm getting is extremely positive. Yes, we should say again, if people aren't on the um, the video, that it's about A5. Is it A5 size? Because we haven't really said what exactly. size it is. Yeah. So it's A5. I well, like we, the A5. We're in a thousandth. You know, we don't use A5 mm. in the US. So it's uh, 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 an inch measurement. But yes, it's ex basically exactly A5. Yeah, but it's what well, I like that size too, because I don't want an A4 journal that feels like school. And I don't want <laughs> like I have some of those tiny journals like um, I've got some on my desk here, but they're too small. And they you know, you can't like you say, you can't get many words on the page. I think this is the most similar to a Luke term. Have you seen the Luke term? Yes, I have. Yeah, which also they have came out in the US uh, when I was about three quarters of the way through my product development. Mm. And the lectern is the closest I've seen to what I put together. It was actually kind of 
freaky because I thought, wow, they're doing the things that I'm doing. And uh, they're very nice journals like them. Mm, they are, it, yeah. So, it's, so just so people know. Yeah. Yeah, so brilliant. So let's um let's just go into it a bit more. So the lie flat because I went in when I had this conversation with a publisher that I went in to see, and the first thing I said was it has to lie flat, and they just kind of looked at me like, oh my goodness, what are you talking about? So can you explain a bit more about the types of binding and why this is such a big deal and how you got over that with um the binding that you use. Yeah, well, this is the yeah, and you also had asked me uh, earlier about cost factors mm, yes. while producing these, and by far on this journal, the binding is the biggest cost factor to get that real lay flat binding. Okay, so you know there are many ways to bind books, and part of the reason it took me so long to develop this, I'd never actually done a book with a flexible cover, uh, like because I really love that flexible feeling. It just feels luscious to me and rich, and I just really like it. Uh, so uh, when I first started talking about this, I was talking to uh, Robin Cutler, hmm. who you may know, who runs uh, Ingram Spark. Hmm. She is the manager of Ingram Spark, and she said, "Oh, that's great, Joel. Do them at, at Ingram Spark, and I'll, you know, I'll help you out." And, I said, geez, Robin, I would love to do that, but I can't. Mm -hmm. You can't POD these books because print-on-demand books use what's called a perfect binding where all the ends of the pages are glued to the cover. You know, they're chopped off and then glued to the cover. Now, that is, you know, and you'll notice on your print-on-demand books, the spine is kind of tight. So they won't open fully. And they won't lay flat. And if you try to do that, you're going to break the spine and you do stand the risk at that point of pages starting to fall out. That's a that's not a good solution. <laughs> so, yeah, this binding is called a uh, soft side case binding. And uh, the, the cover material is actually uh, glued to a piece of paper that runs throughout the whole back spine of the book. And that's what the book block is glued to. And in this case, the pages are all sewn into the binding, so they can never come out. You would have to like physically tear the book apart to make them come out because, you know, and if you open it fully, you'll see little threads, uh, the marks of little threads in the book. So it's done on a case binding machine, which is what's used for doing hardcover books. But instead of a, a board case that's hard, this uses this um, kind of custom material I had made <laughs> another <laughs> another cost factor because <laughs> I couldn't find the exact thing I wanted. So I had to have it custom done. Uh, and, um, you know, with this kind of green and the soft finish and the flexibility. So uh, the binding on these journals is really, really good. And like I say, you can fold them all different kinds of ways and they're never going to come apart. Mm. And, so the binding, but the, but doing that is a lot more expensive than perfect binding, which is a totally automated process where they chop the books, they glue things on, they bring a knife down and trim them. That's it. You're finished. That can be done very inexpensively. But um, if you want a true lay flat binding, you it does cost money. And that's one of the reasons why the journals uh, have the retail price they do. Here in the U.S., we, they retail for $22. Mm. Well, I think I, that's really interesting because I I buy generally I buy Luke terms or moleskins and they mm -hmm. do. I mean, I think they they retail here in the UK for around twelve pounds, fifteen pounds, which would be similar price to a twenty two dollar. And a lot of people say, oh, that's that's so expensive, but it's not. And and I think what you're saying is so interesting because I have behind me in my you can't see them, but I've got shelves and shelves of um, journals as well, and it's. Uh -huh. The journal is emotional. It's an emotional product. I mean, it, for me, like, of course, we all love books in print and ebook and audio, whatever, but it's a taking approach. Uh, reading a book is a taking approach and the product you take from the product. But the journal, you emotionally are involved with it and what you write in it becomes part of your life. It's so important. So what you're saying, I love the fact that you've got a custom uh, material because it does feel really nice. It's very, very, it's, it's it's hard to describe. How would you describe it? Because it, it's not leather. It's got no. some kind of um, 
It's got a grain to it. Yes, it's got a grain, it's and, but a, it's not you know, plasticky. Like That's important. It's not plasticky. It's type of grain. And, mm. you know, when you make these materials, and this is something you find out that's actually kind of cool when you start doing uh, talking to manufacturers, uh, material suppliers. You know, you don't you usually have to settle for just what they have. You can actually create something mm. that doesn't exist. And so uh, by combining the kind of grain, the weight of the cover, the color, and the actual finish on it, this very soft finish uh, that's not high gloss and it's not dead matte, it's kind of somewhere in between, uh, you can create something unique. And, and the, the word I use for this experience is it's intimate. People are very intimate with their journals mm. because you're writing sometimes stuff that nobody else will ever see. Uh, a lot of people use journals. Uh, look, I'm in Northern California. It's the human potential movement headquarters here. I mean, people have workshops and meditations and retreats. And, and they're doing like psychological processing by writing stuff. It's very sensitive material. And so that, that sense of intimacy and, uh, you know, the personal connection you have with the object that you're expressing yourself in, I think is really crucial mm. to, um, to what I was trying to achieve with this journal. Yeah. So let's let's talk about the money in a couple of ways. So first of all, when I went down this process, the actual reason I stopped is because in the UK, blank journals and I like blank journals are taxed yes. like uh, they're taxed as stationery rather than books. And in, in Britain, we have VAT, um, like a sales tax on stationery yes. that we don't have on print books. And there's a certain percentage of text that you have to have to have something classified as a book so that the sales tax is, is different. And I would have had to go through all these different um, hoops to do stationery. So I wondered, um, what, what was that like in the US? Did you find that it, was a, it became a different product, that you're now a stationer? <laughs> No, it's actually totally different. It's a non-issue in the United States. And part of the reason for that is because sales taxes are all locally administered. In other words, we have no national sales tax in the U.S. We have some states have a sales tax. Uh, some counties have a sales tax, which is added to the state sales tax. Some places like where I'm sitting also have a city sales tax. So we have a City of San Rafael, County of Marin, State of California, add them all up. When you go into a shop uh, down the street here, you're going to pay about 7.5% sales tax. But you're going to pay that on anything. Mm. Hot tubs, cars, journals. There's no discrimination about the kind of product you're buying. It's a flat tax on anything you buy at retail. And the retailer has to collect the tax and then report it and pay it to the appropriate uh, government. But it's much uh, simpler. There's no uh, there's no discrimination between different types of products, uh, you know, at this level. So whether I'm a stationer or a bookmaker, it doesn't make any difference. And it's interesting because, of course, and again, most authors who are listening don't have to worry about sales tax because usually we use Amazon KDP, Kobo, Apple. They deal with that, and we just get the money later. Right. But what we're talking about here is not using print on demand. So right. you're, uh, so tell us, how did you do this practically with a print run? How are you selling them? And then how will you, you know, continue to sell them in terms of distribution? Like the, I, 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 that's all really interesting, but I, I would like to point out one thing, Joanna, and that is that the vast majority of print books sold in the United States, and I'd reckon it's probably the same in the UK, are offset printed books. Mm -hmm. The vast, 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 vast majority of printed books, even though in the indie publishing community, a print book is almost defined as a POD product. Uh, I remember when Guy Kawasaki came out with his book, Ape, author, publisher, entrepreneur, you remember that a few mm -hmm. years ago? He, he didn't have anything in there about books printed uh, offset. And I actually, complained to him about that. I said, guy, you know, you're putting this book out here, but you're ignoring most of the books printed. And and the fact is that many self-publishers don't know this, but there's a long tradition, very active tradition of self-publishers publishing print books through offset printing distribution and uh, actually getting to that whole system. 
So basically, uh, you have to contract with a manufacturer. And part of my challenge with the journals was finding a manufacturer who could do what it was I was trying to do. I spoke to at least three dozen printers, I would say, uh, over the course of time. Uh, rather frustrating <laughs> because some of them would say they could do it, but then they couldn't. So you have to vet your supplier. You do have to have capital because you have to pay everything up front. Like in print on demand, we don't pay anything. Basically, you know, over at Ingram, you might have to pay to upload your files. But when they print the books, they don't come and ask you for the money. They deduct the money from the cost that the uh, buyer um, is paying. So, uh, yes, the book printers will not ship your books without having a complete payment for the entire print run in their hands before they kick those books off the shipping dock. They won't start your project without having like a third to a half of the anticipated expense. And, um, you know, but I do print books for clients all the time. And so this is not really that esoteric. I mean, obviously, my journal is an unusual product. But, you know, as far as having a print book, uh, your print runs are going to start at about 500 copies. Uh, because under that, it doesn't really make financial sense. You're going to be paying too high a cost. Now, once you hit about 500 or 1,000 copies, and my guideline for authors usually is I say to them, if you can tell me for sure that you could sell like 500 books in the next six months, I'm going to tell you, go get them printed because they're going to cost you half as much yeah. as what the print-on-demand vendor is charging you. Now, print-on-demand is very convenient but, you know, once you understand how this whole print, distribute, uh, retail system works, then it, it's not really that hard to get into it. Now, for my purposes, uh, my journal ended up creeping up in cost as the production went along. I started off with a really great estimate. Man, I was excited. I thought, wow, I'm going to make money on this project. And, uh, you know, actually the cross kept creeping up. So I got to the point where they're, they're profitable. Uh, and I'm not complaining about the profit, but in if you want to distribute the books, in other words, if I want to have a lot of retailers selling them, then I have to have a pretty low unit cost compared to my retail price. And the reason for that is that everybody in the distribution chain has to make a profit. So they add something to your cost. So uh, let's say I have a book that sells for uh, $10 retail. Um, you know, my distributor may only pay me $3 for that book. That's a 70% discount. Three fifty, maybe a sixty-five percent discount. So from that three fifty on my ten dollar book, I have to pay for the manufacturing of the books, the shipping of the books, and hopefully to have any profit left over. So this is really uh, uh, this is the uh, the subject of many consultations I have with people figuring out this whole matrix between the kind of book you're producing and your marketing. Because the marketing is what should influence that production, not the author's idea of what wonderful thing I want to create. Um, I don't yes. know if I answered your question, Joanna. Yeah, so, well, just on that, um, you had this great blog post about the impossible book project, and that, that related <laughs> to this sort of thing. It's like, oh, I want gold leaf and embossing and stamping and my thing on the back and a, and a hard cover with a, you know, and it's like all of those things add cost in the same way that like adding the the rounded corners adds a surprising sure. cost right so all of these decisions make a difference but the the question coming back to the question was so how are you selling them is it all pre-orders for the print run or are you going to have them ship to amazon and do amazon you know retail or how are you going to do that <laughs> I am not selling on Amazon right now, and I am not uh, retailing at the moment. I'm doing all direct selling, and that's because the, um, you know, developing the journal was expensive. Uh, and I put in a year of work, and you know, I've got stacks and stacks of samples here, and journals and uh, prototypes, and at the cost that I'm paying now uh, for the journals, I decided to start off this this whole enterprise by direct selling. Mm -hmm. And that's also partly, you asked me at the beginning, why did I do this? You know, but 
I looked at my website and my email list, and I said, wait a second, I have tens of thousands of writers. And, you know, I knew that eight years ago, but for some reason the light bulb went off, and I thought, wow, this is a perfect something I'd love to do, and then I know my readers would love to buy, mm -hmm. uh, because who doesn't want a really nice writer's journal if you're a writer? And um, what surprised me is, yeah, so I did do a pre-sale, and I did it explicitly to raise the money to pay the second half of the printer's invoice, because, you know, that makes sense. I'm doing this to put these into the hands of uh, writers. So if I can offer you a discount on a pre-sale, you know, we did fairly well. We sold several hundred journals on the pre-sale, collected all the money I needed to pay that second invoice from the printer. It all worked out great. Mm -hmm. um, but now I'm only doing direct sales. But, you know, this is just the beginning of this product line. I had, you know, the whole idea going into it wasn't just to create a journal, but it was to take these innovations and, for instance, the next set I'm working on will be have many of these same innovations, but they'll be less expensive. Uh, and because they'll have paperback covers. Now, I would like to talk about the covers just for a second. Yeah, because yeah. It illustrates the kind of thing you can do um, when you control the whole production process. Now, it used to be in the old days when all books were offset printed that we frequently did split runs. So a split run would be we would print, let's say, 2,000 books, the interior, the book block, and then we would bind up 1,500 as paperbacks and then bind up the other 500 as hardcovers because that really is not very expensive to do, uh, surprisingly, if you compare it to the price you can demand for a hardcover book, mm -hmm. which is like $10 higher than a paperback book. Yeah. Um, but it's only the cost factor is only about an extra dollar or two. So it, it really is very cost effective. Now, so I took the same approach. I said, well, I could do a journal. And uh, when I talked to the people supplying the cover material, I said, you know, what's the minimum quantity to produce this custom material? And when they told me, I realized I could do the same thing on these journals. And that's why I ended up with two colors, because I thought, well, I'll sell more if I can give people a choice. Right. Some people like black. Some people don't. Uh, so we did a split run. We printed um, a thousand journals and then we split them between the cranberry covers or oxblood, a few thriller people <laughs> and black covers. And that gave me in this, in essence, two products for the price of one. And I'm going to do the same thing on the paperbacks because we're going to do like three or four different designs. But all the interiors will be printed at once, and then they'll just be bound up in the different covers. So, in effect, I'll do one print run, but I'll have four different products. It's, it's, so, it's so interesting because this is such a different world to the kind of print-on-demand model that most people listening will be using. And although the you know the downside is yes, you have to pay up front and do all this design work. What you're now doing is not just stopping. Basically, the one I have here is more of a prototype in a way that you're going to be doing a lot more products. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really interesting to me. Also, you say a paperback cover. This is a soft. So is this called a soft cover? Because it's not hardback. It's it's no no no. Soft. It's not hard. But what I'm talking about is uh, actual like a paperback book has paper that's been printed, right? Like all yeah. your books on your shelf mm. are paperbacks. They have mm. printed paper covers that are wrapped on the interior. In this case, I'm using this special material, you know, in the binding. Mm. But I could have also just taken paper, just like your covers, and printed them and wrapped them in that and had everything else the same. Ah, okay. Yeah, you know, less expensive because this co cover material does is a premium priced product. I see. It's so interesting. And I wanted to ask you about the, the little insert that comes with it, which is the Write Well story. And it's how to free write. It's not, but it's got information on the, um, what the book is, is like for people on, on the video. And then it's got, it's a kind of, it's an A4 that's folded and it's got a little letter from you, including your signature. And it's very personal and it talks about free writing, but it also tells you about the product. Now you are a marketing genius. So <laughs> 
I, <laughs> well, you're very good at marketing. I, I took that idea straight from Moleskine. Ah, okay, but you made it and very personal. And then I personal. created my, my own version. Mm. You know, I, what I found interesting, John, was I was looking at the packaging on Moleskine, and, you know, they come shrink-wrapped, which is good. And, and a product like this should be shrink-wrapped because the customer wants to buy it and cut that open. It's really important, and you know it's pristine. And it's also good because even if you don't open those for a year, when you undo the shrink wrap, they're going to be like they just came from the printer. Mm -hmm. So really important, if you're doing print books, I recommend shrink wrapping, wrapping them in bundles, which is less expensive. And it's just to maintain the integrity of the book. Um, so the question again, <laughs> sorry. It was back on the, the insert. The insert. So, so here's what's interesting. I was looking at the moleskins and, you know, they have the wrap on the book and then it's shrink wrapped and it tells you what kind of moleskin. You flip it over and they tell you the size. And then the only uh, thing that it says on there, it says inside the moleskin story. Mm -hmm. I thought I found that very interesting from a marketing point of view. Was somebody clambering for the moleskin story? Was, you know, was that a big demand? That's the only uh, pull they had. But, you know, Joanna, we talked about this before. The power of story itself is, is incredible. And it's stories that really sell things. You know, if you get hooked into the story, and, and that's why I wanted to tell a little bit the story of creating the journals and uh, how the features that we were talking about uh, solve problems. Uh, and then I put in, that's actually a little mini course on free writing. It's from a book I'm going to be publishing later this year, in fact. And, um, you know, I all of the free writing I've done has been done in journals like that. So it's a, a close personal connection for me. And I thought that would really come through. I added my signature. I use it in many of my emails. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to make it a personal communication between me and whoever is buying that journal. Uh, so they would see what I had done and why I did it that way. And, you know, they're also going to get a little mini course in there because that little mini course really works, by the way. It's, it's yes. good content. <laughs> it is good content. And it's interesting because I, it, made me, it reminded me that the reason I started writing in moleskins back when I was like 15 was because of Bruce Chatwin, who wrote In Patagonia and Songlines. And, a lot, you know, he was a travel writer. He tragically died, um, uh, you know, back in the 80s. But his, the fact that he used moleskins made me mm. want to use moleskins sure. and it connected an empty journal with a writer and that's what i i really appreciate this i think this is genius um but we should we should just now we've mentioned it just tell people what is free writing so they know what that is i have talked about it before but just explain it well free writing is a great practice and just briefly i mean you when you free write you have a prompt and you have a timer and the instruction is uh, when the timer goes off, you start writing to the prompt. And like a very simple prompt might be something like, I remember. It's one of my favorites. And so you're, you're dedicated to writing as fast as you possibly can for the uh, assigned period of time. It could be one minute, 10 minutes, whatever. It doesn't matter. And the idea is to never take your pen off the page. You can't stop. You can't try to find the right word. What you're attempting to do is to write faster than you can ideate your thought, you know, your ideas. And uh, it's a brilliant practice for writers. And I still use free writing sometimes just as a warm up. Uh, the other day I was, uh, doing, uh, I had some writing to do and I decided to do a little free writing warm up, and I did an alphabetical free write. This is without a prompt. Just write down all the letters in the, uh, alphabet and then you start free writing and each word has to start with the next letter of the alphabet. Now what this does is it completely defeats your logical mind. It defeats the grammar you have embedded in your in your language brain, and it allows other things to come out. And, uh, you know, my free writing teacher, Suzanne Murray, used to always say to us, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. 
And uh, I find that to be very true. And it's just astonishing the kind of things that you can come in contact with from within yourself in a free writing session. Because oh. you can't get very surprised. <laughs> yes, I agree. And I definitely think it's great. And I just thought it was fantastic that you had it with the journal. It's almost a bit about you, but a bit about how you could use the journal. So that's fantastic. So um, I wanted to, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to just ask you, okay, we've given lots of tips, but if people are intending to do this kind of special print project like you mentioned doing a project for a personal project for joy uh reasons um but obviously well, we... i'm an old guy so i may get it uh, <laughs> but what, is there anything else that people should think about work, i think workbooks are the first step for many indie authors because if you have a non-fiction book you know you can have two books to sell instead of one very easily by creating a workbook that will really help people and lead them through the process that you're describing, whatever it is. Mm. So a workbook really kind of has to be printed. It is very hard to use a workbook that isn't, is just digital, like a PDF or something. So that's, that's the way a lot of uh, authors end up going into print. And um, I've done a lot of workbooks for my clients, but, um, you know, you do have to have some capital or the ability to raise it. You don't have to have it yourself. If you can do a Kickstarter and really justify your project, sometimes people have actually taken in investors. Uh, that's usually a family member. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> we call them investors, though. And, uh, you know, you have to have some concept of what's going to happen all the way down. You have to work it out in advance, Joanna, so you know exactly what's going to happen. You know, who's going to print them, what it's going to cost, how you're going to ship them, who's going to store them, how are you going to fulfill orders? Like in my case, I'm not using Amazon. So I have a fulfillment house and all these journals were not shipped to my garage. <laughs> I don't want them here. They were shipped to the fulfillment house and all the orders go to them. And there's a software integration on the sales page. So they just get the orders and ship them automatically. You have to work out what the cost for that is. How are you going to do that? Does that fit in with your profit calculations? So, I mean, it really probably would be best to talk to somebody who's walked that path already or a professional in the print professional of some kind to really put it all together in a line for you so you actually understand before you ever spend a dollar, you understand what it is that you're doing and uh, how it's going to work. How are you going to uh, fulfill the orders, etc. Mm. Now, for most people, selling on Amazon is probably a really good idea. I tell all my clients that we don't want to deal with returns, uh, missed shipments, damaged books, all of those things that happen uh, when you start shipping physical products around. Yeah, and I think to me, this that was the big red flag in the end. It was, oh, to do this, I will end up probably not even making any money. And I didn't want to do what, you know, you're an expert at this. You've been doing this for, for many years, like with print products. So yeah. I'm still excited about it in a way. <laughs> but it, you, you've really backed up my decision not to do this. But it's fascinating. What is also fascinating is you started in print specialization and then of course you and I met way back 2009 ish when the indie space was really taking off and digital became the thing and now you're you know this is this is not going back but it's going forward people want beautiful print more so I'm really interested what are your thoughts on the way that the digital space is changing and beautiful print is is kind of resurgent yeah, the revenge of print, I guess we could call it. Well, you know, uh, uh, some of it's perception, Joanna, and some of it is reality. For instance, if you're an indie author, your perception does not include, and I, we talked about this, it doesn't include all the books that are being printed on huge printing presses and bound and shipped all over the world. That is the standard. Right. In the indie author uh, community, I mean, so much has changed. Like, think of all the formats we can publish in now. The fact that indie authors can publish paperbacks, hardcover books through print on demand. They could do audio books. I mean, nobody could do that five, ten years ago. It just wasn't happening. And so you can reach a much larger, a larger audience. A lot of people have gotten 
really learned publishing, people like you who have really studied it and understand how books are made and, and marketed are starting to go more into um, small presses. I know that's familiar to you. Uh, but even people uh, who just got bit by the bug and actually started a, a real small press on a traditional model where they're buying in books and publishing them for other authors. I think that makes a lot of sense. There are cooperatives. Also, the access to the resources you need to publish. Uh, you know, five years ago or eight years ago, if somebody said, well, how can I find an editor? That was like almost a make or break kind of type of thing. I mean, it's very hard to find a book editor. Now we've got marketplaces like Readsy and BiblioCrunch and these people who match you up. It's much easier. And uh, also another thing that's changed is the acceptance of self-publishing or indie publishing. I mean, I, I write a column now for Publishers Weekly. That's, you know... <laughs> That's the Bible of the printing uh, publishing industry in the United States. And it's they have a whole section now just devoted to indie publishing. And, um, you know, that uh, there's no bigger sign of acceptance that I could think of. And we see our titles on bestseller lists mixed in with all the books from major publishers. So uh, the it's really changed. Uh, I think that the print books, I mean, look at the beautiful book that Orna Ross did. Uh, I'm sure that was quite a project. I've done things like that. It's not exactly simple. Um, but I think that the print book universe offers indie authors just a whole multitude of products and, and formats and things that you can't do in print on demand. Uh, and, you know, in all of those genres where ebooks really aren't that big a factor, like if you're not a romance or a sci fi or a thriller writer, you know, you, you really have to look at your publishing business a little differently because, you know, for those people, it makes sense to go digital, keep your costs low, learn about publishing by going straight to digital and worry about the whole print universe later. You know, once you already know what you're doing. So I don't um, you know, unless you have a project that absolutely has to be a print project or an offset project. Uh, and certainly print on demand has expanded a lot. I'm doing a project for an author now that's a two volume hardcover jacketed reference books that are about 800 pages each. Obviously, this is uh, from a um, religious library in Mexico and that all, all the buyers are going to be institutional buyers. So the retail price really doesn't matter that much. Uh, you know, the set may end up going for $150, but, you know, they're all going to be bought by librarians, basically, or religious institutions. So in that kind of market, you know, the whole calculation of the marketing and the production that I was talking about before to make sure you're doing the right book for your market mm -hmm. uh, changes tremendously when you have a project like that. So and this is being self-published. So uh, books are unique. There's so many different kinds. Uh, people often ask me my opinion about this, and I, I always say to them, well, you want to know whether you should do with that book. Let me see that book and tell me what, you, what the plan is. Some books maybe should be with traditional publishers. You know, I'm not against traditional publishing. It's, you know, 99% of the books on my bookshelf were produced by professionals in a publishing company. You know, we can't lose sight of that. And if you, uh, you know, if your name is, uh, you know, Barack Obama, you should be with a pr traditional publisher because they're going to be able to put your book in thousands of bookstores, put you on mass media. But, you know, there are other costs come with that. Other yeah. books you profitably do yourself. So it's a really a book by book decision to me. And then looking to see how we can get that uh, production marketing mix right. So we're producing the right book, pleasing readers and making a profit at the same time. Mm. And uh, I, I don't think Barack Obama's listening to the show, but you know, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> that, that would be awesome. But um, so it's all fantastic. I'm loving, I've got the journal here. Uh, everyone can go and check that out. So where can they check out where the journal is? And also where can people find you online? 
Well, my uh, my home online is my blog at thebookdesigner.com. That's thebookdesigner.com. And you can access all of my stuff there, including our great interior book templates that are just phenomenally popular. And uh, all the other tools and resources we have for indie authors. And uh, the journals live at writewelljournals.com. And um, right now we have two choices for you, black or cranberry coming soon. We'll have a whole uh, much expanded line, but I'm really excited about the positive response I've gotten from people because they're just really loving using these journals. And that's why I did it. So, uh, you know, I, even though uh, it's early days and we're just getting started, I kind of feel like I already won. Yeah, I think I think we've all won, and I really appreciate you coming on today. So thanks so much for your time, Joel. That was great. It's been an absolute pleasure, Joanna. Thanks for having me.